uh, I'll share my thoughts and you can pick up what is right for you. Okay, so let's get started. Journey began in the third year of college, right? Like many of you, I also had dreams and aspirations uh, of getting a job in the Silicon Valley and settling there for a long term, long period of time. Uh, but when I actually got an internship at a Silicon Valley based startup, I spent three months there. This is summers of 2016, uh, right after third year of college. And uh, spending three months there did not give me that right kick. The company was great, people were great, they were doing exciting stuff. But then I felt that my contribution to the company is quite less. I am like there are hundreds of employees and I am just one of the players uh, in that large team. So in fact on some of the days I went to office at 10 o'clock, on some of the days 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, nobody cared, right? After the end of internship I realized that look I cannot be here for a long period of time. Also uh, someone mentioned I come from a Marwadi family so that uh, uh, in my family we are very close to parents. So I could not stay in the west for a long period of time. So when I came back to India I decided that I'll start a company of my own, I'll start a business of my own. Fortunately I had entire fourth year of college left for myself to explore and that's when I got into entrepreneurship. I joined my college school of entrepreneurship and I took up a lot of courses some of which you can see here technology venture creation, marketing for entrepreneurs like uh, many of us would be engineers here and engineers are great at building. In some of these courses I learned that look we have to first understand the customer needs before building something. The best part was that the professors who were taking these courses were not really academicians. They were entrepreneurs themselves. Some of them had large multi-billion dollar listed companies which they co-founded back in 1975, back in 1980s, right? So their thought process was very simple. No pen paper based exams. Go and talk to customer, understand their problem statement, build a company. So I partnered with a friend of mine who was also from my college, same branch. The two of us were very similar, knew each other from three years of college and started the company together. So as a part of the project, we were asked to find a problem statement. One problem statement I had was, so this is a photograph I wanted to show you because entrepreneurship is often glamorized, people wearing fancy coats, buying expensive cars, but this is how really entrepreneurship is. You got to meet your customers, you got to talk to them, understand their problem statements. Our start was very interesting in the sense that after meeting three banks, we met a fourth bank which is a large public sector bank. We, we got our first client and it was a great start starting point for us and they also floated their uh, our name to their group company. So this large bank, they supported us, they gave us the contract of roughly $100,000. Just imagine two 21 year old starting a company and they get the first contract of $100,000 from the largest public sector bank in the country. So it was a great start. We had our ups and downs during the journey. When we onboarded this customer, for example, we had to, to go through multiple stakeholders. Like we are selling to a large enterprise. There is a business team. There is an information technology team. There is a security team, legal, compliance, procurement, finance. All of these nuances, both of us had to learn. We were programmers and that's all we were. We knew how to write code. We did not know how non-disclosure agreements work. We did not know how master service agreements work, but we were able to spend time to learn these things and execute it with our customer jointly by getting their mentorship. Everything started well. The bank gave us the contract. We deployed the product. It was a mega launch on their foundation day on 1st of July. After that, they introduced us to their group companies, which is the subsidiaries of life insurance, the subsidiary of mutual fund. In India, you all would be aware, right? A bank has multiple subsidiaries, uh, a, a bank, a life insurance, mutual fund, a stock broking company and a non-banking financial corporation also, right? And sometimes they have a housing finance company separately. So we got entry to all the group companies in one shot and it was a great starting point. We started hiring some employees. We hired one full-time employee. We had an intern. Everything was going well, but all of a sudden my co-founder decided to leave. Now you may ask, why did he leave? Because uh, when everything was going well, the problem was that I came from a small family, let's say $15,000 a year kind of earning and our contract was $100,000. For me, that was a six times more money. On the other hand, my co-founder came from a very rich family. For him, it was a fraction of money that his father used to earn. So that is why he felt that the opportunity was much smaller and he left it. But then I kept my resolve. I realized that, look, 
there is something if four large enterprises four multi-billion dollar companies are willing to pay for our product we are up to something good if i can get four customers i can get 10 customers if i can get 10 i can get 20 if i have 20 customers i have a meaningful business in place so i kept my resolve i asked my friend harshita who was at that time working at another bank in pune and I convinced her, I explained her the situation, I explained her the potential that our customers had in terms of the size of business that could be created. She found it interesting, she realized the opportunity and she left her job. It was She had a three month long notice period after which she moved to Mumbai and both of us started building this company. As you can see the third bullet point, we divided the roles. I was on the customer side. You know, I spent so much time with one of our customers. When I, so in large banks, you would know that when you enter their office, the corporate office, you have to provide your laptop serial number from a data security perspective. The security guard had memorized my laptop serial number because I used to go there so often. When I went to canteen and if the credit card was not working for whatever reason for some payment issue, network issue, the person at the canteen told me you come tomorrow, you pay me because you come every day. That's the amount of time I spent with the customers. Like within the bank ecosystem, people thought I am an employee. I, I, I was always there. I was everywhere visible in the large office. That gave comfort to the customer. They gave us more contracts. This is December 2018. Four months after my co-founder left, we got a large contract of roughly 14 lakh rupees. After a while, this is April 2019, six months after my co-founder had gone, six to eight months, I hired one salesperson. That is another interesting story. So. Typically, when you hire a salesperson when you, uh, or you apply for a job at a startup, you will start thinking that, okay, the founder will come in a suited booted coat, suit, and the sales guy, uh, they will come in a suited booted, all wearing fancy watches and all. That's what happened. I called the guy to my college campus because I stay nearby. And uh, the guy comes in a very fancy suit. He's wearing shoes, expensive watch to impress me. And I'm driving a scooty, wearing my polo t-shirt at night. Uh, like whatever you t-shirt I slept with at night, the same t-shirt I wore next day and reached the campus. I was 22 years old. I had no idea how to interview a salesperson. So you know what I did? I just asked him for three long hours, what he did at his previous company, what were their sales processes? How did they sell? It was a completely unrelated company. It was an ed tech startup and I was in an enterprise SaaS space, right? Building software for large financial institutions. But then the, because as I said, because I did not know how to interview salespeople, I just asked him all sort of questions. After three hours, I was not convinced whether I should hire him or not, because I am a techie, I'm a programmer, I've never hired a salesperson in my life. So next day I took him to some of our customers. And then again, he asked me a bunch of questions after the meetings, which got me very, uh, interested in him because uh, he was showing interest. He, he did not understand all the technical jargon I spoke in the meeting, but he still asked me questions. So after that, I thought I'll give it a shot. And I hired that person. Today, he is heading our sales. He's handling a team of more than 15 people. He's grown from there. So, and he has been so supportive that we used to go to, we could not afford a cab, right? This is early days of our company. Co-founder left. Money is very less in the bank. I had a scooty. We used to drive 20 kilometers on express highways to reach to our customers. On one way, he was driving. On the other way, I was driving. So now another interesting phase that happened in COVID period. So as I mentioned, our solution was to help large enterprises automate a part of their customer support. The chat and chatbots, which we built, they helped the banks answer the customer queries without requiring call center agents or without involving humans. Now, by the way, many people may have an interpretation that AI is taking away jobs. That's, that's not true. Net banking did not take away jobs from branch people. Net banking and branch coexist. Same way the chat channel is an additional channel. It's, it's, it, it helps the bank extend the facilities to newer channels. For our customers, it became a bigger problem. Because see, we were a small startup. When COVID hit, we were roughly 15 to 20 people at that time. But the large institutions, they have bigger problems. How do employees access emails from home? And executives are fine. Companies provide them laptops and all. But what about a call center agent, a support agent? How will they access the email? How will they access calls from the end consumers? How will they reply to support tickets? That became a problem for these big banks. That is when we came to the rescue and we said, while you get your call centers back in place, we will give you automations from these chatbot solutions. All we did was persist. We took small steps every single day. We did not give up because I'm just giving an example so that all of you can relate. My co-founder had the same exact opportunity as I had. Both of us had same exact college background, same computer science background, same technology background. All I did was not quit. All I did was 
to stay firm and execute every single day rather than thinking too big take small baby steps and i think that is what is very important in life and all of this paid off when in 2021 my company got acquired you can imagine right many of the things which seem like luck actually is a matter of persistence because i bothered to go to that advisory meeting now this vc fund they invest in late stage companies i was a very early stage startup less than half a million dollars in revenue even then i chased him i met him because i said ki it's always a good option to stay in touch with smart people to stay in touch with people who are connected in the industry whether or not business happens doesn't matter at some point in time things will pay off for us it was a great opportunity because the acquiring company had more than 7000 customers across 50 countries they had spent a decade acquiring these customers one by one for us it was a shortcut because now that we are a part of their portfolio we have access to all of their customer base all of a sudden so if i do that it will take me another 5 7 years but now i have that direct access easily so this venture capital partner he introduced us to the founder of the acquiring company we had long discussions we had long negotiations it went on for a while because when such large transactions happen you got to understand what is the risk i had burnt my fingers with my co-founder already and here i was saying that let me partner with another company acquisition is not like a reversible relationship where if you don't like someone you give them a termination letter and say tata bye bye it doesn't work that way once you have acquired you can't say give take your money back and give me back my shares right so it's an irreversible relationship harshita which is my co-founder and i we spent a lot of time thinking what is the stake on the table what is it that we have to offer and what is it that we are getting basis all the decisions which uh, basis all the thought process which we could think of we took the decision that it it is it is the right opportunity to partner together and i'm proud to say that in the last one year it has gone really well we have got the right support i am running the conversational ai business the chat business as an independent subsidiary and both companies utilize each other's expertise like we take uh, utilize the expertise of the acquirers presence in startup ecosystem the the voice expertise and so and they utilize our expertise in the banking and financial services so yeah some of my learnings which i would like to share because that is most important this this was the journey so far first start early you know the biggest benefit we had when we went to these banks they did not see us as salesmen they did not see us as entrepreneurs we presented our college id card and said ki look we are academicians and researchers from so and so college and we would like to understand your problem statements and offer help with technology nobody will get defensive if this is your pitch they will like to offer help they will suddenly think that they are on a sitting on a higher pedestal and they are you are reaching out to them for mentorship so when you put someone on the higher pedestal they will always be willing to offer help so that was a strategy we used it was i mean you can call it a shrewd strategy but i think that was the way we approach people so that's a first part and this you can do when you are in college many of you are in college and i would highly encourage you guys to explore entrepreneurship as a career option because this time is not going to come back at this time you don't your parents don't expect you to earn money you don't have a liability of a home loan you don't have a liability of a family so this is the best time to explore yourself understand yourself which is what i did in the fourth year of college second don't give up so as you can see from my journey the difference between my co-founder and i was all that i didn't give up i had my own share of problems i had my own share of difficult situations tensions headaches because at the end of the day when all of this happened i was also 21 or 22 years old which is which is not a mature age and i did not have any prior experience of dealing with such situations but definitely what i had learned during my engineering entrance exam preparation or my fourth year four years of college is that do not give up in life whatever be the situation results might take some time to show up but then they will show up if you continue taking small actions every single day third focus so as you saw chat or conversational ai products are very generic i talked about travel sector i talked about food ordering i talked about e-commerce in the beginning but when we ended up with large financial institutions that's what we truly nailed like one of the legendary entrepreneurs has written on on his blog that it is always better to be a big fish in a small pond rather than a small fish in a big pond so take a small space and nail it down really well leverage your network so one thing i really did was leverage the hell out of my college network like i reached out to a ceo of a large insurance company i just wrote him on linkedin he replied we got a meeting and they are our customer chief digital officer of another bank same thing cio of another bank same thing so i realized that my college is good i have a decent network i should leverage it because my the alums of my college they are sitting at large uh, senior positions in large enterprises so i 
I absolutely killed it. And a generalized point over here is to find your unfair advantage. The unfair advantage I had was I came from a college which had this kind of network. If you are not from such a college, what is your unfair advantage? For a simple example, I tell you, there must be someone in your group who you reach out to whenever you have to travel somewhere. You have to go to an outing, you have to go to a hill station, you reach out to someone. You have an event to organize, you reach out to this person. Now this person already had an, has an unfair advantage in travel. That is why people are reaching out to him or her to understand ki I want to go over a weekend. What is the best resort you recommend? Right? I'm sure all of you have that, right? It is because they have an unfair advantage. It is easier for them to build a business and travel than anyone else because you are their customer. You and many of your friends are customers on day one if they build something like this. So find your unfair advantage and this is not just about entrepreneurship. In career, in your life, if you want to progress, find out what is your unfair advantage. And that, and most likely that unfair advantage will come out because of the fact that you really love doing something. Like the person who is an expert in travel really loves to travel. The person who is an expert in event management really loves to manage and organize events. Find out what is it that you really love to do. And that is where you tie your passion with your profession. Next, execution is the key. So as I told you some of the instances that we went on to, the, to meet the customer in a scooty. At that time, we could have said that, look, we are doing half a million dollars of revenue. One more customer will not create an impact. That's fine. Let's not go. Let's go tomorrow. Let's cancel this meeting. But we were relentless. We said we have to do this customer meeting. Customer is the king or customer is the queen. If, if, if they call us for a meeting, we have to go. In early stages, that's how the execution has to be done. And lastly, don't chase investors, chase customers. We all hear the news of $5 million raised by XYZ startup, $50 million raised by some uh, fintech company. You know, all of this happens. When all of this happens, the journalists, what they do not publish is the story behind. The story behind acquiring 1 million customers. And that is when you get a lot of funding. Customers are the ones who are the who will give you money and not take it back. You know, employees will draw salary. Advisors will want exit at some point in time when you get bought out or when you get public, they would want money. Investors invest to get money back in the form of returns. Customer is the only one who gives you money not to ask it back ever. Obviously, you have to give the product in return. So if there is someone who is really funding your business, it is the customer. So that's how I think we followed the approach. We were very customer centric and we just went crazy when it comes to customers and we completely ignored the investors and I think that paid off really well. At the time of acquisition, my co-founder and I held 97% of the company. Just 3% was given to some advisors, some angel investors, that's about it. We did not have any institutional investor. And I think irrespective of the nature of business, this is the Guru Mantra. This is the mantra that every entrepreneur must follow. That's it. Thank you so much.